Hello everybody, this is Michelle, W5NYV. Here's a link to my resume if you want to see my professional credentials. I'm here today to share a presentation with you. This is a proposal for a work in progress for an open source communications satellite. It's a HEO, or highly elliptical orbit, but most of this work applies to GEO as well. High orbit satellites from HEO to GEO are of great interest to all of us. Open Research Institute, where I spend a lot of volunteer time, has been very successful in laying down the regulatory groundwork to allow international collaboration, open source, and open process amateur satellite work. This is regulatory relief that we did not have before. There are two parts to this regulatory work. First, ITAR and EAR regulatory relief with an advisory opinion on publishing on the internet. You can see a poster session about that work here at Ham Expo. Second, debris mitigation and orbit talks with the FCC. You can find a link to that work at our booth, and the ex parte filing is available directly from the FCC. What do these two things accomplish? First, that open source work and international collaboration are safe, sane, and documented. This work was completed in August of 2021. Second, that the FCC understands the orbits that amateurs are interested in. There are two that ORI discussed with the FCC. First, straight to graveyard, which puts a geo spacecraft into disposal orbit directly. The mission plan must be done completely and carefully, and there is no automatic approval of a license. But the FCC understands what the community wants and has no objection to pursuing designs that use straight to graveyard. This is very good news. Second, modified HEO, such as the orbits in this proposal that we are talking about today. Modified HEO avoids the growing number of commercial LEO constellations by raising the perigee to 1,250 kilometers. This has advantages and disadvantages, which we'll be talking about. This work was completed in November of 2021. You can find it in the MVP folder in our regulatory repository. MVP stands for Minimum Viable Product. The paper discusses an amateur-centric approach to communication satellites given debris mitigation rules. These efforts took a lot of time, several teams of motivated and competent volunteers, and some amount of money. Funding for the legal work required for the ITAR and EAR work was provided by YASMI Foundation and ARDC. Thompson & Burke LLC was the law firm involved. The debris mitigation and orbit workshops involved a small amount of private funding and ARRL provided support, including counsel. Thank you to everyone that was involved in these regulatory successes. The regulatory work sets the stage for the technical work. This current effort is based on a proposal from Jan King and a team of volunteers that helped him. It was presented in 2014 to AMSAT NA. AMSAT did not follow up on it, and there is a story about why, but it's not my story to tell. The proposal surfaced a number of times in the open source amateur radio scene. I put it out to the ORI mailing list for discussion and potential adoption. The timing could not have been worse because it was the week that COVID-19 started shutting down things in the U.S. back in 2020. In the summer of 2022, McHugh Murray of JAMSAT suggested that I try and find something to propose to JAMSAT for HEO, and I immediately thought of this proposal. I asked Jan King how he felt about updating it. He was all for it, so we started working on it and building a team. We've had three work sessions, all recorded and published for anyone to watch. We walked through the proposal and identified the areas that needed to be changed. A lot has happened in the years since the proposal was put together, but it was excellently done, and the basics have stood the test of time. This is a fully open source project that is open to any participant almost anywhere. The team is already international. JAMSAT members have given invaluable guidance for the updated design. Our goal is to produce the highest quality proposal possible. Librespace Foundation is in the loop and their membership has been supportive and helpful. All AMSAT members are invited to participate and several have signed on. There is a pledge of $50,000 from an individual donor if the proposal is accepted. If you can match this or want to contribute financially, then get in touch. All versions of all the slides are available in our repository. We'll, we will be going 
quickly over some of the slides today in order to focus on the areas of greatest progress and where we need the most help. This is a team effort. It's a great privilege to be able to present the work of so many people. ORI has a very flat organizational structure which lets projects be projects and doesn't put a lot of impediments between the people and the planning. ORI has clearly defined participant and developer policies, a code of conduct, and a culture of keeping the focus on the project. This reduces overhead, increases diversity and inclusion, and helps produce a lot of good work that is made freely available to the general public at no cost. If you would like to see more of this in the world, please consider joining our leadership team. So let's get to the proposal. Items in red are action items. They are actively under revision. First, we have the mission objectives. In 2014, communications was still considered to be experimental. We have changed that to clearly state that the mission objective is to deploy a functional communications resource. The original proposal had 10 gigahertz and 24 gigahertz as the amateur communication frequencies. During the work sessions, it was requested that we consider QO100 frequency plan in order to allow reuse of ground equipment. And we have an existing open source transponder design that uses 5 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz. So we are talking about prototyping a system here that uses as many of these frequencies as possible. With powerful FPGAs and a vibrant firmware and software scene, we have plenty of opportunity here to show innovative designs that leverage multiple microwave bands. Thank you to the several microwave societies in the US and in Europe that have already provided feedback, comment, and critique about multi-band transponder possibilities. So a full transponder would have one, two, five, 10, and 24 gigahertz bands represented. Note the 0.5 meter dish requirement. This is from Jamsat. Japanese operators have limited space to work with. This is a change from the original proposal and it does affect the link budget. This mission demonstrates open source design work and there is an opportunity for small scientific payloads. We will not select or propose experiments, but as you will see in the system block diagram, there will be interfaces for experiments. We defer the choice of experimental payloads to whoever accepts the proposal. There are so many good ideas for experiments, and other organizations will have informed opinions that we will want to support, and connections with experimenters that we simply do not have. We want to provide the widest opportunities for science, technology, art, and culture in space. Mission objectives continue with specific open source propulsion goals. We will show the ability of electric propulsion to carry out critical mission functions while not interfering with high-speed digital communications. Finally, this is something that we center in our work. We will promote international goodwill and amateur technical education through open source design and development. We do not believe in opaque or authoritarian methodologies. We believe that amateur radio should be inclusive and supportive and that gatekeeping is for trolls. HEO missions have a past. Here are four missions that a lot of you may be very familiar with. Some of these were international and collaborative. It's past time to go back to space like this. Our community is fully capable of doing this. The challenges and resources and formats are different now, but we are up to the challenges. We have the resources and we have mastered the formats. The next thing the proposal addresses is orbits. We will have a Japanese-centric orbit along with a North American one and however many more we need. The big change from the original proposal is raising the altitude from 500 kilometers to 1,250 kilometers to avoid crossing over the orbital shells of the commercial constellations at low Earth orbit. This change comes from what we learned during the regulatory work with the United States Federal Communications Commission. There are at least two drawbacks to raising the altitude like this. First, desaturation of the reaction wheels is harder if you don't go down to something like 500 kilometers. So this is something that we need to quantify. Second, preliminary analysis shows that the delta V is higher. We have a result from an AMSAT DL volunteer that it's three times higher at 1250 than 500. So we will be using GMAT, or the General Mission Analysis Tool from NASA, to specify the orbits and to produce the values needed. This is an open source software. It's high resolution and widely used. The US FCC is encouraging spacecraft to deorbit as soon as the mission is completed. This modified orbit may consume more fuel than the original proposed orbit. These two facts are not necessarily in conflict. A goal of ORI work is to get faster turnover in space 
for amateur missions so that we can build up a larger archive of proven designs instead of having one egg in one basket at a time. To be very clear, the FCC no longer really wants 25-year plans. They want missions that work hard for less time and then get out of the way. Five to seven years is the goal for this payload, with 10 years being a true stretch goal. We take the guidance from the FCC to heart and are working hard to enable as many payloads as possible, each with shorter mission times than in the past, and a much greater priority on deorbiting than were envisioned, say, in the 1980s. The payload is at least a 6U spacecraft, or six units. This is the 2014 physical configuration. There are some things that will change, such as the solar panel deployment style, and there will be a lot of sensor fusion and less mass, and we will move things around to where the engines are not right by the antennas. The spacecraft internal volume allocation is most likely going to change, but you can see the thinking from 2014 here. We really want to get the engines as far away from the antennas as we can, because even with the synchronization work that we're going to include, it still needs to be far the further away. This is the original functional block diagram, and it will be both heavily relied upon and revised. Here is the communications subsystem system block diagram. There are four parts to this. There's a digital board. There's a telemetry, tracking, and command board, or TTNC. It has a dedicated RF link. And there are at least two RF communications boards. Here we show a 5 gigahertz uplink and a 10 gigahertz downlink subsystem. Note the RF switches here. This is something that we want to prototype right away. These switches flip if the digital board dies, or they can be flipped on command. The entire thing is converted from a fancy digital regenerative repeater system into a straightforward what goes in is what comes out type of transponder. OK, so why would we do this? Well, we want the communications resource to work regardless of the digital brains. It will negatively impact the link budget. And you will lose some functions, like authentication and authorization. But you get something that can fail over instead of just fail. This is important to us because we are pragmatic about communications. If you want to be part of building this prototype, get in touch. Assumptions about CubeSat power systems have changed. This proposal will have a simplified 28 volt subsystem. Solar arrays will not be hinged the same way they were for the original proposal. Um, we're looking at fold outs on the long edge. The mass budget will change. Assumptions about mass per unit are now lower. Attitude control baseline is reaction wheel with off-the-shelf components. These need to be updated and the effect of a higher orbit very carefully modeled. By the time you are watching this, some of the work may have been done. The recording date for this talk was on the 1st of September. Here are the operating modes for the attitude control system. The original proposal used the IHU from Fox, but this will be updated. The Virago processor is the baseline, and there are several other choices, including RISC-V open source space qualified processors. The basic assumptions for what was called a regenerative microwave transponder are essentially the same. The addition of adaptive coding and modulation in the DVB-S2X protocol is especially useful on 24 gigahertz due to the effect of water in the atmosphere on this band. Access to the transponder was listed as contention based, but we have a better scheme with authentication and authorization. That work is being presented this weekend by another ORI volunteer, so please check out the schedule. Also, all presentations will be on our YouTube account after the Ham Expo platform closes about a month from now. A quick note, here is a diagram describing the token generation. This is a brief snapshot of the innovative work going into the uplink protocol. The forward error correction on the downlink and the uplink has been updated. The downlink is BCH plus LDPC, from DVB-S2 and S2X, and the uplink uses opulent voice with convolutional and Golay encoding. High bitrate Opus codecs are used in the native digital uplink. 16 kilobits per second is what we're testing with, but Opus can go up to 500 kilobits per second. You will have excellent voice quality using our uplink, and data can be transmitted without having to switch to a clunky packet mode. This work is being developed for terrestrial use as well. If you are interested in helping make an open source microwave band HT with excellent voice quality, then there's a team working on this, and you are welcome to join. We deserve excellent voice quality on Earth as well as in space. We'll be using an FPGA-based approach for the digital functions on the spacecraft. The reference design uses Xilinx 7000 chipsets and analog devices RFICs. You can access the development stations over the internet. All of the development hardware is in ORI's remote labs. 
There's a full Vivado license and a full MATLAB license with all the toolboxes. You saw a deep dive presentation on the downlink encoder about six months ago at the March 2022 Ham Expo presented by Andre Suato. We will need more people to help with integrating the reference design on flight hardware, so if this sounds exciting to you, then welcome aboard. We also have an ultrascale dev board up and running for the next generation past what we're talking about here. If you want to help get polar codes on the air for deep space missions, we have your back. Power amplifier notes are here. This or a similar part uh, is going to be the baseline. I'm going to skip over the link budgets for now for two reasons. First, we have an excellent link budget spreadsheet from Jan King, which has been recently renovated and expanded for our purposes. And we already know that enough has changed from when these budgets were done that they're no longer accurate. And I'm going to make an editorial note here about link budgets. They are where items. If you're not familiar with a link budget, then here's the 20. A link budget is very similar to a financial budget. You have power that you can spend, and that power must create a signal that the receiver can hear. You have degrees of freedom that you can use to create more gain in the transmitter. What that transmitter throws up must be able to be received by the receiver. So it is like balancing your checkbook. But the thing that most people miss about link budgets is that actual hardware and real environments are pretty ugly and messy. Many link budgets are just too simple. Therefore, they are too conservative. Some link budgets, arguably the massive Excel spreadsheet from Jan King, are too complex for casual use. If you don't know the right answers to all the values in the spreadsheet, and for Jan's work there are a lot of values, then you can end up with an answer that's wildly wrong. Link budgets are truly accurate only when the system is complete and you can measure everything, backfill the link budget, and go, ha ha, look at that, it worked. So at this stage, we do have link budgets that show we're in the ballpark, that we can close the link, and that's good enough to put our backs into this and get it done. We will be using Jan King's extremely advanced link budget along the way, but it will be for documentation as much or more than as a predictive tool. We have the answer, we can close the link. It's up to us to get every last tenth of a dB out of the link because any increase is an increase in throughput. This is how real systems tend to be built. The link budget is an extremely valuable tool to get the most out of the design, and we're past the first hurdle here. The TTNC will probably not change much at all. This is an area where if it isn't broken, please don't try and fix it. There are a fraction of us that think in-band signaling should be attempted because it's much more elegant, but the burden of proof on reliability is pretty high. Here's more about TTNC. There's link budgets for the telemetry tracking and command as well. RADFX was proposed for this payload, but as explained earlier, for this proposal we are providing an interface for experiments, but not specifying them. Imagine if RADFX could have flown on this HEO if it had been accepted by AMSAT NA. Pretty cool proposal. The one experiment we can do inherently is a precipitation attenuation study. And I'm really excited about this. Here's the original proposal, which involves a beacon. However, with adaptive coding and modulation in the downlink protocol, we may be able to report results simply by letting the protocol adapt to the channel, record what it does, and cross-reference this with meteorological data. There is a big opportunity here for sensor fusion, computer vision, and machine learning. This is essentially ambient science because the communication signals themselves provide valuable weather-related data. This makes transmitting on 24 gigahertz much more interesting as it allows us to see weather with our transponder. How cool is that? Here's the original design for the attenuation experiment. We think we can simplify this and also extract more data than originally envisioned. Now we come to the electric propulsion subsystem. ORI has the green light to develop an open source application of US patent number 10006445. This is a wonderful opportunity and we are going to take full advantage of it. This vacuum arc thruster micro propulsion subsystem is an outgrowth of the GWU Micro Propulsion and Nanotechnology Laboratory research. NASA Technology Readiness Level 8 flight hardware has been tested on orbit on BRICSAT and Cannibal. The engine will do two things. It'll raise the orbit and assist in disposal. A key part of this patent is synchronization of the motors, which reduces negative effects on broadband microwave communications. Electric motors create a lot of noise. We have a fundraiser going on right now to build engineering models and to retest the design. Here are some very early photos of the engine. And here is historical video 
of the engines firing. You want to like uh, just go ahead and actually. Um, okay, basically this is going to be a, like an introduction session. This is a power supply, all right? Power supply. Which is got, set to channel. Uh, which is set to channel two. Volts. Yeah, go we ahead. We got fifteen volts. Right. So on. we're going to put labels on these to make sure if people are running it, they don't get these mixed up. Okay. It goes into our power board. Okay. Power board. This also gets powered by yep. the twelve volts. So twelve volts, twelve volts. Um. Then we come over here, which is coming from the, I guess, soon to be the phone, currently right. the computer. Yeah, the computer, the phone is going to be over there. We're going to put labels on here. We're going to put labels on there. Right, okay. So this is a, uh, a secondary protection unit of on-off switches for our units. Okay. And then once the signals start coming, we're going to flip them on. Right. And then from the phone or the computer is when we're going to start allowing them to fire. And, and the, over here, these are the thrusters. thrusters. So we have one, two, and three channels. Okay. And they're all coming from a common a trigger a source, as we can see with the big mass of wires that we have here. So effectively, we're going to be actually. So they're all going to be simultaneously. All right. Let's come back. Right. So step and one, I believe, is power. Okay. Right. So power on. Right. Okay. We're powering on. Sure. You get green and, lights. And you get green lights on the, on the power management board. All right. And you got a green light here All right, to make great. sure this whole board is working. Okay. With all these lights. Okay. Okay. Step two. And now. everything is powered off, so the, these guys are not, uh, lit, not lit up. Yet. Right. And they're going to be, uh, you know, controlling the power to those uh, yes. uh, structure channels. Yes. Okay. So our next step. Now that the computer currently has gotten power from our system, it and looks the, and like the menu has come up. On. All right. So the menus come up. And now we need to... Uh, you need to define the frequency that you're going to be working on. Define the frequency. I'm going to click 1. Okay, great. Go ahead. Because I want 1 hertz. Right, and that actually uh, set it to a time delay of uh, 99928. Okay. You know, pulse, uh, counts, basically. That's okay. fine. We'll, we'll translate that later. Go ahead and initiate the pulse by pressing the number 6 button. I'm going to go to 6 on the keyboard. Yeah. Click 6. There we go. And we can see the, can the, see the pulse, pulse train. coming up. Well, we can see the indication of the pulse coming up. Yes. All right, go ahead. And okay. Then we're going to shift over. And so shifting over, now we want to give power to our units now that we got the, the pulsing going. So I'm going to turn all three of them on at once. So we're going to go unit 1, which is this one. You okay, can see let me just, just see the power. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. You've got so green light for, the, for number 1. So we have a green light from a This is just the logic, the L bus. Yes, the L bus. We want P15L, logic. basically. Okay. So we got two, two. power coming we, on. Hold on a second. Let me go back to this thing. So we're still drawing 0.19 or 0.18. Okay. All right, now go ahead. Number three. three. You can't really see this. This is a different lid, but there's a little green, there's a green light in here showing that we're getting power. Yeah, and so we haven't closed the cover with, yet. So Yeah. So currently with our system, mm -hmm. without the cover, sure. there's your light. So currently with our system, we're getting a pulse to our uh, low side, and we're also getting power to our low side. So now we're going to enable power. Okay, for the first time, for go, first time. go, yeah, go So ahead. I click little Z or big Z? Uh, big Z is for enable, big X for enable. So, so Z is channel one. Z is, so yeah. we're going to do channel one first, shift yep. Z. Yep, go. Shift Z. Enable channel one. So and right away we hear one. this uh, version. should be this top one. We're getting yep. a little click. And you actually did uh, channel one, two, and three. In, one, in two, three. Oh, wow. It's like a red, stop, red, green stoplight, right? Yes, exactly. So it is great. Okay, go ahead. So now channel and two, we click shift Y. Yeah. So shift Y. It says enable channel two. And we have two of them thrusting. Yep, and I, my video is recording the two, two uh, operating in sequence in air. And now I do shift X, correct? Yep. Shift X. Three is pulsing or not pulsing? <gasps> It's uh, pulsing. It is pulsing. It's you pulsing, just can't. It's yeah. very, very light. Right. But those are the adjustments that we have to do uh, with the yes, thrusting. Yes, that's adjustment on. I on think the screw, thrusting. I think the screw head needs to adjust, you know. Okay. Be adjusted. All right. All well, right, so well this is just, you know, the first uh, trial. So uh, you want to shut it off by just uh, tell us what you do. What do you shut it off with? Okay, so. Just there are some more recent uh, videos of the hardware and a discussion, and that's in our YouTube channel. The original proposal had a total integrated dose experiment. This is a very low volume experiment. We are, we are concerned about radiation, so we will very likely keep it. Here is a view of the expected interfaces. The double lines indicate redundancy. There is both a hardware and software heartbeat between the SDR board and the TTNC. This allows for different recovery modes. Here's the beginning of the RF plan expressed as a diagram. The entire scheme will be represented like this as some of the assumptions about the RF chain had changed since 2014. Here is a walkthrough of some of the system architecture reasoning and decisions. Here's what's been reviewed. 
There is a system architecture document in the repository, and these are the slides that go with that work. So first we have the system block diagram. Here's some detailed callouts highlighting critical parts. Note we have splitters and bandpass filters here. The splitters work in concert with the switches in order to implement our failover mode. There will be losses and complexity associated with the extra parts required to pull this off. If the digital board fails, the switches activate and signals are routed around the digital board. Here's a very high level estimate of the riskiest parts of the design, some similar designs that can be used as resources or references. This is the hardware states, which are defined as the RF switch states. We have four modes. There's a transponder mode, digital mode, transponder plus UHF telemetry, and digital mode plus UHF telemetry. Our SDR has preloaded files so it can operate as a beacon so that people can test their stations. The idea here is to roll through all the modulation and coding combinations in DVB-S2, S2X so that the station capability can be measured. The default digital downlink content will play when there is no traffic. You can see an example of this working as our terrestrial multimedia beacon project. We have a playlist for this part of the project on ORI's YouTube account. Here is a description and context for some of the requirements for interfaces. We think of the TTNC system as an intelligent router, and we know that the TTNC bus needs to be multi-master, hot swappable, and low power. There's a finite state machine involved with the collection of the telemetry. The heartbeat monitoring and fault recovery are also managed with the state machine. Here's the definition of the fault detection, isolation, and recovery. There's three sets of undesired effects and specific mitigation strategies. We aim for graceful degradation and not the elimination of all faults. The most frequently asked about extension is a camera. There are two options and they are enumerated here with their advantages and disadvantages. We can put a camera on the digital board and have it interface to the SDR FPGA, or the camera can have its own TTNC bus interface. What other resources do we have? LibreSpace Foundation LibreCube project provides a baseline design for 1U cards. LibreSpace Foundation has given us a lot of support and welcomed us to their community. We are deeply appreciative of the friendship and advice they have given. ORI is a signatory to the LibreSpace Manifesto and fully supports LibreSpace Foundation's goals and purposes. Open Source Satellite Team is a source of advice and assistance. They have a highly competent team, make regular presentations, and have a deep commitment to education and inclusion. Open Source is a wonderful way to advance the peaceful use of space. We have several commercial partners from radio and space industries. We have a variety of people at ORI that work in the space industry or have worked on amateur satellites in the past. A lot of us currently have circuits in, or in orbit and are very excited to be working on this proposal and the hardware that will come out of it. What do we not have? Well, we don't have an experienced thermal design person and we don't have a lot of mechanical engineers on staff. Our area of expertise is in general digital wireless communications and systems design. If you want to contribute in any area, you are welcome. Some areas need more help than others and mechanical and thermal are the greatest needs. What happens next? Well, we push hard to complete this proposal to the best of our ability. All of this work will be done entirely in the open, and all work is published as it is created. We then present it to Jamsat for review and judgment. If they accept it, we support Jamsat's lead. The vision is to form a coalition of willing partners to build and launch multiple satellites using this design, using any of the orbits we've studied. Worst case, we have a publicly updated proposal for an amateur HEO satellite supported by a large array of engineering models and published designs. We firmly believe that our international amateur community is capable, fully capable, of accomplishing this design. We have never had a better time to do advanced digital communications work. We have solved some major regulatory roadblocks. We have accessible lab equipment and development stations. This equipment is available over the internet nearly 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with technical support. We have a growing number of published designs, and the community wants to see this happen. It cannot happen without your interest, your reviews, your expertise, and your support. Want to join? Please click on Getting Started at openresearch.institute on the web. You do not have to be an expert to join. You just have to be willing to become more of one along the way. Thank you.